Today we're going to be continuing our, looking at our series on walking in the spirit and today we're going to be looking at part two of our healing uh, session. Last week I mentioned that we're all part of Israel's story and Israel means one who struggles with God and God uses suffering in our lives in order to shape us for the next. And sometimes we should see our own sickness as a, a wake up call. Is there something in my life that I do need to confess? Am I living in sin and that I, I need to repent of something? And we need the same attitude as those free young men um, who are being cast into that fiery furnace. That if he doesn't heal us, we're still going to worship him because he's still good. He's still good. He's able to heal us. And even if he doesn't, we're still going to worship him because he's still good. He's still a good, good father. And he's God, we're not. In my introduction to the series, I mentioned that different traditions often have a canon within a canon. A book in the Bible that they give greater focus to. And by that, I mean that they sort of interpret the rest of the Bible through the lens of that particular book. So, you know, I suggested that Lutherans might have Galatians where they talk about those faith alone versus the law people or Calvinists might have Ephesians and everything becomes about predestination and both use Romans to talk about justification in that way. Wesleyans and Methodists often use first John in order to focus on holy life and and holy love and Pentecostals use the book of Acts. Uh, Acts in a similar way. Acts becomes the way in which we interpret all passages about the Holy Spirit. And Acts is a very great book. It is. It's a really good book. And yet Acts begins this way. Acts 1 verse 1. I love the way it begins. It says, in my first book, I told you, dear Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach. So Luke here refers to his gospel as the beginning of everything that Jesus began to do and teach. Friends, Jesus is alive. He's alive. Acts and beyond, Jesus is continuing his ministry in his body, the church. We're the continuation of the story. The Gospel of Luke is the beginning of Jesus working. And that's great news because it means the rest of the story is even now being written. We're part of that story. John Wimber, the founder of the, the Vineyard Movement, said faith is spelt risk. And by that, he means that we have to step out into faith. We often have to risk looking stupid. We ask ourselves, what happens if I pray for someone and then God doesn't show up? When the question that we should perhaps ask is, what happens if he does? What happens if we pray for someone and God does turn up? So in James 1, we're asked by James to submit to God. And turn away from our love of the world. He says in verses 2 and 3. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you do ask, you don't get because your motives are wrong. You only want, want that which will give you pleasure. So here James makes two really, really important points. Number one, that often we don't receive because we don't ask. That's important. Often we don't receive because we don't ask. And sometimes we don't receive because we have bad motives. Sometimes we just don't receive it because our motives are wrong. James says that often we want that which will give us pleasure. What will give us pleasure rather than the source of pleasure himself, our Lord God. We want things rather than we wanting him. And that's especially true for healing. And I think we need to make it clear that often we want a healing when we want should want the healer. And the healer is always, 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 always worth far more than the healing. So in 1 Corinthians 12, 1, when talking about the gifts, Paul writes, it is the one and only spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. And this is important because it's in the sovereign will of God 
who gets the healing. It's not our will. We can't manipulate God or anything else, but it's rather God's sovereign will who he chooses to heal in what time. And in my message last week, I spoke about Isaiah 53, 5 and the need not to twist scripture, to take it out of context in order to make it what we want it to be. And another example that people often give referring to healing ministry of all what all Christians should be doing is Matthew 10, verse 8, which reads, Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, cast out demons, give as freely as you have received. And whilst this is a really lovely passage, in the context, the command and the authority to do all those things is given to the 12 apostles, not to all Christian. There's no verse um, in the New Testament where Jesus commands all Christians, you must be out there, you know, casting, um, you know, raising the dead and, and those sort of things. Obviously, Christians do do those things because Jesus does them through his body, the church. But it's not you you're not a christian if you don't do these things okay it's not uh, every christian should be going out and you're being disobedient if you don't do these things okay so in verses five to eight jesus says this we, we read jesus sent out the 12 apostles with these instructions i'll just repeat that jesus sent out the 12 apostles with these instructions don't go to the gentiles or the samaritans but only to the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. Go and announce to them the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, cast out demons, give as freely as you have received. So the instructions, that particular verse. So elsewhere, obviously, Jesus sort of encourages all Christians to be on mission in the world. And obviously sort of casting out demons, all those sort of things is about general ministry of setting people free from darkness. OK, so all of the Christians are those sort of people and all Christian. There's a priesthood of all believers in which all of us can are given gifts by the Holy Spirit in order to build up and set people free from, you know, dominion of sin and death and hell. But. This particular verse that people often use in its context is referring to the 12 apostles. And why choose verse 8 just to lift out of context? Why not verses 5 and 6? Don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but only to the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. Why not lift that verse out of context if you're going to list a verse? If we did, I think that would change our evangelism strategy somewhat. Um, Friends, we can't just lift a verse out of context and then say this is binding on all Christians. All Christians should be doing these things. Uh, there's no verse where Jesus commands, particularly the raising of the dead as being something that all Christians are commanded you should be doing. OK, and some do. Some do in his name. And that is great. But I'm talking specifically here about what is commanded that we do. And therefore we're being disobedient if we don't do. Uh, yet the miracles that Jesus mentioned in Matthew 10, verse 8, heal the sick, the raising of the dead, the curing those with leprosy, the casting out of demons, do happen today. And they've happened all through the church history, through the body of Christ, the church. One Catholic priest, uh, Father Al Alfred Hebert, has documented over 400 stories of resurrection miracles in the lives of saints, often within the last 200 years. And sometimes Protestants particularly, you know, we can be very suspicious of Catholic claims to miracles, especially if they involve relics and other things. But if you believe your Bible, then you have to at least be open to the idea in Second Kings uh, 13 verse 21. We read, once there were some Israelites who were burying a man and they spied a band of raiders. And they hastily threw the corpse into the tomb of Elisha and fled. But as soon as the body had touched Elisha's bones, the dead man revived and jumped to his feet. So the Bible here records someone being raised from the dead because his body touched the bones of Elisha. That's the Bible, folks. This isn't about St. Cuthbert or some other sort of medieval saint. So in Acts 19 11 to 12 we read also god gave paul the power to do extraordinary unusual miracles when handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on sick people 
they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled so god saw fit to heal people through relics whether they're elisha's bones or handkerchiefs or aprons that had belonged to paul but it's the sovereign will of god where these things happen okay so paul his traveling partner uh, trophimus young timothy they all continued to live with illness and sickness within their lives so in all these cases it is god who heals and he uses means often to heal us he uses physical objects to heal us whether that's anointing oil or someone's hand on our heads or whatever it might be god often uses physical means because we're physical beings and he does it in his time not our time so whether it is looking at the bronze serpent, whether it's laying hands on a person, placing mud in their eyes or anointing them with oil, or touching their garments or through bones or through handkerchiefs, whatever it might be, it is God who heals and he does so through his in his own time, not our time. It is his sovereign will, not our will. And I just want to take some time now just to travel through the Vineyard's five step healing model, because I think it's a good one. It's a good model. And while there aren't really methods and models to healing, it covers a lot of the basics and a lot of good ground. So step one, the interview stage. So ask a person, if you're going to pray for them for healing, ask them, what would you like me to pray for? This is important because just because someone's in a wheelchair doesn't mean that that's what they want prayer for. Just because someone's wearing glasses doesn't mean that they want their eyes prayed for. And they might want prayer for something else. OK, so we need to be... You know, what, what do they want prayer for? Uh, we shouldn't assume things. OK, so that's a natural level, supernatural level. We should be asking for words of knowledge or discernment or, or visions. And it's, it's not a medical interview, but we are to try and gather the facts and then move on to the next stage. Stage two, diagnosis. Why do they have this condition? So th there might be very natural causes. You know, there's a virus going around or a bacteria or there's um, an accident that's happened, you know. Um, but it might be a response to sin committed by them or on them by someone else. Or there might be emotional hurt that's causing physical pain or, or other sort of psychological trauma. There might be relationship problems. There, there might be a lack of forgiveness, which is causing manifestations in their lives of these things. And it might be supernatural. There might be a demonic oppression or something else. And so we need God's help in discernment and perhaps praying tongues or whatever it might be. Just, you know, try and find out, ask the Holy Spirit, ask to be led by the Spirit in these things. But the outward problem might not be the problem at all. The outward problem might just be the outward problem. There might be a root issue which we don't know about, but we need the Holy Spirit's guidance to bring into our knowledge, into our awareness, into the human consciousness here. So step three, prayer. What kind of prayer needs to be over this person? So check, is it OK if I lay hands on you? Because it might not be. They might not want you touching them. So um, just say, is it OK? And if it's not, it's not. Ask the Holy Spirit to come to minister to the person. Uh, ask for God to heal. Um, keep praying in the spirit. Sometimes it might be a command of faith like Peter in Acts 3, 6, where he says, I don't have silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get up and walk. Or it might be if there's sort of you feel led by the spirit, there might be something sort of demonic um going on a demonic um sort of oppression or something then just rebuke it say in the name of jesus christ leave in the name of jesus christ leave um and then step four prayer engagement so how are things progressing keep your eyes open you know is there any signs that god might be working ask questions you know from a scale of one to ten you know are you feeling better or not and stop when you think it's over. The spirit tells you to stop. You run out of things to pray or when it's going nowhere. Because remember, it's about God in his sovereign will to bring healing or not to bring healing. OK, so if nothing's happening, that doesn't mean that something's wrong. It might just mean God saying now's not the time. OK, so it's OK to stop. You don't have to go on and on and on for hours and hours and 
do everything else okay just say okay in his sovereign will it is not happening now okay uh, so remove your hands and just indicate that now's the time to stop okay uh, post prayer you know um jesus after he healed the the lame man said in john 5 14 now that you're well st stop sinning or something even worse may happen to you okay and often jesus when he's meeting people he says go and sin no more you know he brings healing and restoration but then he says go and sin no more and so you know talk to people about that you know if, if there is sin in their lives go, go and sin no more stop living in that sin read your bibles spend time with god uh, get involved and in, keep involving in the church and check with the doctor if it's always possible keep a record of the healing as verified by the doctor we don't want it just sort of saying well i prayed i thought i had this and then i prayed and now it's gone Okay, that, that's great that it has gone, but we want proof, you know, that God is working, that God is active, that Jesus is still victorious over the powers of sin and death and hell. And so, you know, we, we just want a, a record of that, you know, so you had cancer and now you've been declared free of cancer. They're the sort of things that, you know, we would like. Uh, you want proof that a healing has taken place. And that's what I love about New Day as well. You know, that they often bring people back, you know, a year, two years later uh, with proof, you know, and said, I was prayed for in New Day last year. And, you know, here's proof from the doctor that the problem I, I was dealing with, it's no longer there. That's excellent. That, that's good practice with any form of healing ministry. Matthew 8 verses two and four we read a man with leprosy approached him that's christ and knelt before him lord the man said if you're willing you can heal me and make me clean jesus reached out and touched him i am willing he said be healed and instantly the, the leprosy disappeared and then jesus said to him don't tell anyone about this instead go to the priest let him examine you take along the offering required in the law of moses for those who've been healed of leprosy and this will be a public testimony that you've been cleansed. So Jesus commands the man, go present yourself to the Levitical priesthood so that you can perform the ritual purification ceremony. Go with the offering required in the law of Moses, you know. So um, whilst doctors, you know, they don't carry out ritual purification ceremonies on us involving, you know, splatting us with pigeon blood or anything else, they do declare us healthy or sick. And so in many ways, we should always try and speak or you know, have a confirmation of healing from a medical expert, you know, OK? So in Mark 8, uh, 23 to 25, we get another window into healing and we read about Jesus. He took the blind man uh, by the hand and brought him outside of the village. Then he spit on his eyes, placed his hand upon his eyes and asked, do you see anything? Regaining his sight, he said, I see people but they look like trees walking then jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again he opened his eyes so his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly for this blind man the healing was not instant but in two phases and we should take this to heart that not all healings are instant sometimes there's other work that needs to be done you know under the surface Friends, the symptoms on the surface are not always the problem at all. In one study on the psychological effects of forgiveness or holding a grudge, the team found that forgiveness may free the wounded person from a prison of hurt and vengeful emotion, yielding emotional and physical benefits, including reduction in stress, less negative emotion, fewer cardiovascular problems and improved immune system performance. Unforgiving memories and mental imagery might produce negative facial expressions, but also increased cardiovascular and sympathetic nervous system reactivity. Much, um, you know, all sorts of negative emotions. So the person in the above situation might have been presenting issues of anxiety, stomach cramps, uh, you know, fight and flight sort of symptoms, you know, bad dreams, heart problems. And yet the real issue was unforgiveness in their life. 
and we're embodied creatures and what goes on in our thoughts and in our attitude does impact our whole bodies. So there's another element that we need to acknowledge and that is this world is a cosmic battlefield. It is a war zone. John in 1 John 5 19 says we know that we're children of God and the world around us is under the control of the evil one. Paul in 2 Corinthians 4 4 writes Satan who's the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand the message about the glory of Christ who is the exact likeness of God. Three times in John's gospel, in John 12, 31, John 14, 30, John 16, 11, Jesus refers to Satan as the ruler of this world. And that is why Jesus tells us in John 15, 18 to 19, if the world hates you, remember it hated me first. The world would love you as its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world and so it hates you. Whilst John can call Satan the ruler and even Paul calls him God of this age of the world, we're, we're part of a mission. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. and We're commissioned by the light to be light in the world. And we belong to the true ruler of the world, the father of all, the maker of heaven and earth. And throughout the New Testament, there's these themes of the light versus darkness, truth versus the lie. There's two kingdoms. And Christ, the light, has won victory over the darkness by his victory over death. And when God defeated enemy, his enemies, it looks like a man dying on a, upon a cross in self-sacrificial love for the other. But I say this because sickness and plague are often linked within the scriptures to demonic forces. And in Acts 10, 38, Peter says, with respect to Jesus from Nazareth, that God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went around doing good and healing all who are oppressed by the devil. Healing those who are oppressed by the devil because God was with him. So Peter here talks about Christ to Cornelius from a very human perspective, a human point of view, um, you know, a man anointed by God. Um, and Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 writes, even though we've known Christ from such a human point of view, now we do not know him in that way any longer. So Jesus was more than a man anointed by God who could do great things by God's power. He was God himself. And so, you know, Paul says, although we once knew him according to the flesh, no longer do we do so. Rather, the veil has been lifted and now we see him for who he really was. Therefore, we know him to be Lord and God. And Paul's po uh, Peter's point, however, is very important. Jesus came to liberate people from the power of darkness. And part of that is from sickness and caused by demonic oppression. Uh, the fact is that all of us are guilty with participation in sin. We've all played our own part with the rebels against God. And part of growing in faith is repenting, turning away from our rebellious attitudes and our participation in sin and turning to God in our participation in the spirit. So part of our prayer for healing is resisting those forces of darkness and fighting against them. So in conclusion, God does heal today and he does so through the body of the Messiah, the church. And we're called to work with him in the world to bring life, light and hope. And part of that role is resisting evil, praying for the sick. But in all circumstances, we acknowledge that God is sovereign and he uses all things for our good. He permits things into our lives that we might resist them and turn to him, that we might be changed by them in our turning to him, that we might become like Jesus Christ through them. Amen. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness to us today. We pray for those in our audience who are, are feeling like they are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, Lord, like they are suffering. We pray for healing for them, Lord. We pray that you would restore them, that you would set them free on this journey right now, Lord. Be with them, we pray. Amen. Amen.